All right, here we are talking about macromolecules, um, which is a fun and exciting part of biochemistry. It's also one of the last parts of the biochemistry unit that we're in right now. Um, so let's jump in and get through this. So macromolecules is just a word for, mac uh, for large biological molecules. Um, as you can tell from the name, we're talking about molecules. The prefix macro refers to big in Greek, right? So we're talking about big molecules. They're not just water molecules. They're not just individual glucose molecules. These can be quite large molecules um, that are in all living things or that exist in living things, depending on what living thing you're talking about. And there are four types of them that we will talk about. We have carbohydrates, we have lipids, we have proteins, and we have nucleic acids. And we're going to talk about those in some depth in terms of their structure and in terms of how they're made. But before we talk about specific classes of macromolecules, let's talk a little bit about some kind of general terms that are useful for referring to these macromolecules. So what we find in these, um, in these macromolecules is that they oftentimes have um, repetitive smaller pieces that make them up. Right, so I, have, I, I think about like Legos or building blocks or beads on a chain, right? So you have small pieces that make up a larger, um, more complex entity. And in this case, we're talking about molecules. We're talking about macromolecules specifically. And we have terms to help us uh, describe those kinds of uh, molecules. And so when we talk about the individual pieces that make up these larger molecules, we talk about monomers, because the word mono comes from the Greek word for one, right? So monomer is the one, it's the smallest building block that makes up the larger molecule, which we oftentimes refer to as a polymer, because poly means many, right? So the polymer is the, the thing that is made up of many pieces, whereas the monomer is the individual piece, right? And you can imagine maybe like beads on a chain or something, or on a string, this isn't the best diagram, but you get the point. <laughs> These individual beads are the monomers, right? And then this entire uh, string of beads would be our polymer, right? Because this is an individual one monomer and these are many. And when we um, talk about the, the process of making these types of uh, polymers, um, we talk about the synthesis of these monomers or polymers. And synthesis is just a word for the process of making something. You can talk about the synthesis of your lunch. Um, maybe people would look at you funny, but you could be using that to describe just making a lunch. Anyways, um, when we talk about polymers, we talk about dehydration reactions, right? And a lot of these polymers are made in reactions uh, that involve the, the formation of a water molecule. Right, because dehydration, hydration has the word water um, in it. D means uh, kind of, in this case, it's like coming out of, right? So you're losing water. And the reality is that in these synthesis reactions, often a water molecule is made as a byproduct. So not the main product, but an additional product. On the flip side, when we are breaking polymers, we need water to help us break them in, break the, a piece off, break off a, a monomer. And so we have a hydrolysis reaction. And that again, we have the hydro, water is involved, and lysis is from the word to break, right? So a lysis reaction is something that's breaking something, that's cutting something. So hydrolysis reactions is when polymers are broken down. And let me show you some diagrams to make this a little bit clearer. So we have our condensation reaction, which is also our dehydration, yes, reaction, right? So here we have a short polymer that's made up of one, two, three pieces, right? These could be amino acids, these could be nucleotides, these could be glucose molecules, they could just be anything, right? So they're just drawn as these kind of general monomers, right? And so there's three of them, and there's an additional fourth one that is going to be added onto this chain. So we're synthesizing, we are making a polymer. And in that reaction, and the, the details that aren't shown here, but the important point is that in that reaction, a molecule of water actually is broken off and made as a byproduct. 
and now suddenly we have a bond that's formed between our two monomers and we have made our polymer chain a little bit longer, right? And so we call that a dehydration reaction because a molecule of water is broken off in that process and a polymer is made larger, okay? So it's important for the synthesis or for the making of polymers, okay? And then on the opposite end of that, we have the breaking of polymers, right? So when we um, want to make a larger uh, polymer chain shorter, if we want to break off a monomer, that would require the addition of water, right? So we need hydro, we need water to lyse, to break our polymer, right? And so we call that a hydrolysis reaction, okay? So try to remember this. It's really important that you um, keep track of all of these new vocabulary words. And I remember this one because I can remember that lysis is a word for breaking. And so then I just remember, oh yeah, something lysis reaction, hydrolysis, oh, that's a hydrolysis reaction for breaking polymers. Where And then I remember that the other one is dehydration, so that must be making the polymers, right? Maybe you just remember them because you remember everything, but... That is not the case for me. Um, so now we're going to talk about specific uh, types of polymers. And we're going to start with carbohydrates. Carbohydrates, yay! Um, you've probably heard all kinds of stuff about them. Carbohydrates, carbs, they sound like they're really bad, but they're actually really great and important. Um, but they also you know, are related to weight gain, as you might know. Um, but carbohydrates are just all kinds of sugar. Right? And we're not just talking about sugar that you put in your coffee or that you put in your tea. We're talking about cellulose, which is, this, which is a carbohydrate that makes up your paper and the table and the chair that maybe you're sitting in. Um, we're talking about starch, which is really important for storing energy in all sorts of vegetables and, um, and fruits as well. We're talking about chitin, which is part of bugs. We're talking about glycogen, which is in your muscle and liver in large quantities. There's all kinds of carbohydrates, right? And we have these general terms for them um, to talk about different types of carbohydrates. And um, they always have this saccharide as part of their name to help us know that we're talking about sugars because saccharide comes from the word sugar. And a monosaccharide, as you might imagine, is a single sugar, right? And this is our kind of smallest kind of sugar. Um, that might be glucose, it might be fructose, it might be galactose, right? These are single individual sugar molecules, and I'll give you examples of it. Um, then we have our disaccharides, which are two sugars, and they're bonded together. They're not just hanging out next to each other. And there's a few important examples of those as well. And then once we get bigger than that, I mean, you could talk about trisaccharides, but what, what we really want to talk about are polysaccharides, and those are ones that have many sugar molecules that are bonded together, and they make the larger kind of macromolecules that we've been talking about. So let's take a look at some examples of monosaccharides. Um, the most important one that you just need to know, and if you don't know already, then you really need to just hammer into your brain, is glucose, okay? If I wake you up in the middle of the night and I'm like, give me a monosaccharide, you should be like, oh my god, yeah, glucose. Um, you shouldn't even have to think about it. But glucose is a really important monosaccharide that we'll talk about over and over and over again, um, and it's right here shown uh, in this diagram. It is a six carbon sugar, um, and it forms this wonderful, uh, I think I have it on my next slide here. Yeah, I totally do. Um, you'll see it in this kind of linear form uh, drawn sometimes, but actually you'll definitely see it much more often in this wonderful hexagon uh, form with an oxygen forming one of the corners. And um, when it is in water, it usually forms this ring, even though it's kind of a straight chain. That's not really that important, but just so that you know, these, these are all the same thing, essentially. Um, another important um, monosaccharide that you should know about is fructose, okay? And so fructose is an A6 carbon, uh, oh, sorry, no, it is, what am I saying? Um, fructose is another important monosaccharide, and so is galactose, okay? Um, you'll also learn about uh, ribose, uh, but we're not really going to get into that that much right now. 
you should definitely know, though, glucose, fructose, and galactose, because we'll talk about what happens when they form disaccharides. Um, so like I showed you before, we have our monosaccharides. They oftentimes will form rings when they are in water, so you won't always see them in these straight chains. Um, and then when these monosaccharides join with another monosaccharide, sort of like hold hands in, some, in a special kind of bond that we call a glycosidic bond, which is this guy right here. Then they form disaccharides, which are two sugars that are bonded together, or two monosaccharides that are bonded together. Right. So if we take a glucose molecule and a glucose molecule, and they form a bond between them, remember, through our dehydration reaction, right, synthesis of, of polysaccharides, um, then we form a disaccharide called maltose, right? And a lot of times these disaccharides or these um, carbohydrates will have an os ending, which indicates that it's a type of sugar. Um, and there are other important disaccharides uh, that we'll learn about, but what you should remember is a disaccharide is two monosaccharides bonded together, and they have a particular type of bond, which is called a glycosidic bond. Um, we're not really going to get into the 1,4 or 1,6 stuff right now, um, but there are different types of glycosidic bonds too. Yay for science being always so complicated. Um, so moving on, <coughs> uh, we have polysaccharides. As you remember, polysaccharides is that it's made up of many, or it's a polymer that's made up of many monosaccharides, right? And these polysaccharides are the macromolecules that we were talking about before. And in animals and in living organisms, these, these types of molecules are really important for energy storage and structures um, in cells. Not all cells, uh, but especially in plant cells. Um, but energy storage for sure, right? So starch is important for energy storage in plants. Cellulose is a huge component of cell walls in plant cells. Glycogen is what allows you to run for longer than a few minutes at a time. So let's talk about some polysaccharides in detail. So starch and glycogen are both um, really important for energy storage. Um, starch is only found in plants, unless we're talking about starch that you eat if you eat a plant, but what I'm saying is like naturally occurring, being synthesized by the organism. Starch is energy storage in plants. Glycogen is energy storage in um, animals. And you, as a human being, have a ton of glycogen in your liver and your muscle that allows you to um, access energy uh, over large, not super long periods of time, but like if you're on a run, like uh, 30 minutes into the run, depending on your fitness, um, you would start tapping into these stores and using your glycogen stores in order to be able to continue to exercise. Now, um, then we have, or no, I think I have a picture that would be useful. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, so starch um, is just a bunch of glucose molecules. Actually, all of these are glucose molecules. Well, not chitin, but we'll get there. Um, so it's just a bunch of glucose molecules that are... These, each one of these is a glucose, which is a monosaccharide, I hope you remember, and they are just connected in this long chain, and this is actually like a coil, you can't really tell from this diagram, but it's like a coil of glucose uh, molecules that are attached to each other, and there is an occasional branch to it, but it's just these like coils of glucose, whereas glycogen is also kind of coils of glucose, but there's more branching to it, right? So it's not just... You know, it's not just one coil, but it's sort of like a, another coil that's branching out, and then there's like another coil, and then there's like another coil, and then there's like another coil, right? Whereas for starch, it's more kind of like coil with like an occasional branch, okay? Um, and glycogen, remember, is in animals. Plants have starch, okay? Uh, let's talk about cellulose. Cellulose, again, is found in plants, unless you eat cellulose, right? Like you eat plants, like when you eat plants, you're eating cellulose. But what I'm saying, like plants make um, the cellulose, and it's really important for cell walls, which when we talk about our plant cells, uh, the cell wall, as you'll remember, is this like outside part of the cell that provides um, protection and structure. 
for the plant. Um, and again, cellulose is just made up of a bunch of glucose uh, that's connected. And there's um, the type of bond that they have, again, is this 1,4 glycosidic bond or linkage. Both of those words you'll come across. Don't be scared of either. If we look at a diagram of cellulose, it's not this like coily stuff that we saw with the starch and the glycogen, but it's these kind of long strands of glucose that are all kind of like just kind of going for a really long time. <sighs> Excuse you. Um, and those strands will kind of like lay, be like you know, uh, on top of one another, and eventually they form these kind of fibers that um, are the fibers that make up the cell wall, which eventually, then when you take a piece of paper, there's a bunch of cellulose, okay? Which is pretty cool. And again, that's a carbohydrate. Now, you might be thinking, oh wait, energy? Maybe I can eat my homework if I'm like really hungry and I need energy. It's not that simple. Um, you can't digest all kinds of carbohydrates. Um, in particular, cellulose is really hard to digest, and as a human, you won't really digest it very well at all, right? Um, you would need special enzymes um, and special conditions to allow that carbohydrate to be digested so that you could get the energy from it, and you don't really have that. Cows don't really have that either, but they have this sweet like setup in their stomachs where they have a bunch of bacteria that is able to kind of break it down for them, and then they can use it themselves. It's a wonderful little symbiosis. You don't really have that going on, um, for the most part. Uh, so you can't really get a lot of energy out of cellulose. And that's why cellulose is fiber. So I don't know if you've ever heard of people saying, oh, you need more fiber in your diet to kind of help things move along. But um, fiber is very hard for humans uh, to digest. And that's why it's helpful for um, your uh, bowel movements because it kind of helps push things through in a more regular kind of way. Now you know. One more kind of carbohydrate that I want to talk about is chitin, um, which is maybe you've noticed in all of these previous carbohydrates that they're made up of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen. Um, but not really anything else. It's mostly just carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That's why they're called carbohydrates. Chitin is an example of a polysaccharide that does not just have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, but it also has doo -doo -doo, nitrogen, okay? And it's a polysaccharide still because it has this monomer sugar, but it is found in bugs, and it forms the exoskeleton of bugs, and um, it's really important for the structure of their cells, as well as the exo or the cell walls of various mushrooms. Um, and chitin has actually been used uh, in in biomedical applications for the surgical thread because it's a strong fiber, um, and it uh, breaks down over time, which is useful if you have stitches that you want to like break down eventually. Uh, so chitin is actually really useful and important um, in the biomedical sciences. So let's talk about some review questions. So here's a question. Uh, what is a chemical reaction uh, mechanism by which cells make polymers from monomers? Take a moment to answer that question. Hopefully you went over this and will have the same answer that I do. Um, so, remember, we're talking about the chemical reaction for making polymers. So we know it's not hydrolysis because we know that's breaking, right? And hopefully you remember that, um, well, a lot of this won't be very familiar because it's not true. They're just uh, red herrings. Phosphodiester linkages we haven't talked about yet. We haven't talked about ionic bonding in terms of monomers, right? These are not ionic bonds. These are covalent bonds because we're all these are all nonmetals that we're talking about. And we didn't talk about any disulfide bridges. That has to do with proteins. So hopefully you remembered that it's a dehydration reaction that's used to make polymers from monomers. Uh, next question. 
Which of the following best summarizes the relationship between the dehydration reaction and hydrolysis? Take a moment to read through your options and choose your best answer. Um, hopefully you've chosen uh, an answer by now. So if we read through these options, let's go from bottom to the top. Hydrolysis creates monomers. Dehydration breaks down polymers. You know that hydrolysis is what breaks down polymers, so that's not right. Dehydration reactions can occur after hydrolysis. Uh, that might be true, but it doesn't really describe their relationship. Um, dehydration eliminates water from lipid membranes. Uh-oh, you know that's not right because we're not talking about lipid membranes here. And so hopefully you already figured out that dehydration reactions assemble proteins, whereas hydrolysis reactions break down pro polymers. And I think that's all for carbohydrates for now. The next part is lipids.